some of the joy of my current experience of this current like transition shifting space is discovering new parts of myself and new bits of my identity that haven't got to have a name before, mm. like, but they didn't get to be identified or looked at or, or cherished. There's joy in that. And there's also grief and a little bit of loss in the, like, the image that I had in my mind of the way that my career was supposed to go. Welcome to the Everyday Talent Podcast. I'm your host, Betty. Are you a multi-passionate person? What I mean by that is that you have more than one endeavor that you want to pursue in your career path. I'm multi-passionate. I knew that ever since a very young age. But in practice, once I graduated with an arts degree and pursued my first passion in filmmaking, it took me a long while before I fully embraced that I had other interests in business design, nonprofit consulting, and eventually today in coaching. For those of us who work and operate with the belief that if you're not focusing on one thing, and you're not successful, and you're not committed enough, career transition and reinvention can be particularly tricky. We are not just reaching from one professional identity to another, we are actually unlearning the belief and expectation to only ever do one thing on a professional path and developing what I sometimes call parallel universes or constellations of my, our interests. You can imagine my excitement then when I met Javelin. Javelin from, knew from a very young age that they want to be an actor, and for a long while in their career, that's what they did. As they describe, every single career move was geared towards building their path as an actor. There comes a moment that they didn't want to attribute all of their well-being to only one professional identity. And in fact, they know that they've always been interested in human psychology, coaching, and counseling. Today, Javelin is a coach, educator, and storyteller with a special interest in neurodivergent world building. They consider themselves an alchemist, transmuting the raw material of life into something uniquely their own, and are passionate about working with humans who live outside of the box. How did Javelin embrace their multifaceted self? What were some of the rewarding and challenging moments in reinventing themselves from an actor and to today as a co coach, educator, storyteller, and still an actor? Also, what are some things to be aware when coaching and working with neurodivergent humans? Let's lift the curtain and dig deep with Javelin in this conversation. So welcome back to another episode of the Everyday Thailand Podcast. Uh, today on the podcast, we have a fellow creative and also a fellow coach for creatives. And I'm very excited to have you here, Javelin. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Can you briefly introduce to the audience uh, what you do and then uh, multiple different things that you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so, hey, audience, I'm Javelin. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm an actor first. Um, I've been an actor in film and television and theater for about 10 years. Uh, but more recently, I have started fostering a parallel career path as a coach. Um, and I coach neurodivergent humans. Specifically, I generally work with humans who have ADHD or who are autistic or who are fun combinations of both ADHD. Uh, I'm neurodivergent myself and find a lot of like meaning in working uh, within my community to help build systems and worlds that work for us instead of against us. Yeah, and I, I guess I have like a special soft spot for working with artists, particularly because let's be frank, artists and neurodivergent people, this is a Venn diagram with a lot of crossover. So mm -hmm. yes, um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I tend to work with a lot of artists. Mm -hmm. I'm nodding my head here because I, uh, lots of my clients, uh, I either officially uh, have a, had an assessment and identify as a neurodivergent or they self-identify as neurodivergent. So there is definitely a lot of close that caught overlaps with between those two communities there's yeah. lots that what you just shared there and what a strong mission that is like building a mm -hmm. system and world that for neurodivergent folks and not against i love that yeah we're going to dive into that in a second but let's like <laughs> take, take a step back and walk us through like how did you get into kind of your 
I mean, I call that fir- your first career goal, your acting. How did you get into acting? The first time I was on stage, I was six. Ooh, wow. And, uh, yeah, I, I played a who in How the Grinch Stole Christmas at the church that I grew up in. Mm-hmm. And I was livid that I was not Cindy Lou. I was just <laughs> a random who. Um, but I remember distinctly like internalizing it's there's no small parts. There are only small actors. You already um, told yourself that it's age of six. Wow. Yeah. I like, and I was, I was in love. I was hooked at that point. It wasn't until I was 14 that I'd like made a clear, like, oh, this is going to be my career decision. And then naturally as a like young adult out of high school, I had a lot of like anxiety about making the right choice for a career, but ultimately made the decision close to the end of my undergrad in psychology that I would regret not trying at least uh, to be an actor. And I think in making the choice to be an actor, I became more the kind of person who would want to be an actor. Does that make sense? I think there's like a self-fulfilling kind of prophecy thing that happens there where Mm -hmm. the choices that we make form us more into the kinds of humans that make those choices. So yeah uh so out of university i just started auditioning and doing theater and doing the thing so Mm -hmm. something powerful in what you share about like me making a choice of becoming that identity or professional identity it becomes we become more of that person yeah uh and it seems like is that a similar process that you went through when you decided to also at coaching to your professional practice. Yeah, I think coming back to coaching was sort of a return to my second career option at the time. I was, Mm. in my mind, I had to pick between when I was, you know, 19 or 20, I was like, I have to be a psychologist or I have to be an actor and there's no way to be both or to, to balance both or to have more than one Identity, and I think somewhere in my late 20s, I figured out that I was allowed to be as three-dimensional a character as the ones I was trying to play. Um, and that realization like opened the doors to, to pursuing other things aside from acting. Because up until that point, everything I did was about acting. Like mm. absolutely everything. The jobs I took to pay the rent, the people that I hung out with, the opportunities I accepted, all of them were a calculation about whether this was going to make me a better actor or not. Hilariously, I think in making choices to do other things, I have become a better actor. (laughs) Let's unpack that. There's so much to unpack there. This like kind of uh, transformation that you had between like when you were just coming out from college and choosing one part of the other, and then later realizing that you can be a full character or human, like the like character you try to portray. How did yeah. that happen? How did that happen? Uh, it was a lot of life experience, a lot of like realization that I I have more than one desire, that I'm more than one thing. Mm-hmm. I think that there's a, often in creative industries, there's a like kind of core belief that sits at the bottom of the whole industry about how if you're not fully committed, if you're not, you know, the starving artist, Mm -hmm. then you must not want it bad enough. Yeah. And I, I don't think that's true. I think that that's a, a deception. And I think it's actually pretty unhealthy. It certainly was unhealthy for me because it ended up looking like a really unbalanced life. It ended up looking like a lot of financial difficulty and strain and stress and ultimately ended up looking like me taking acting gigs because I needed the money, not because they were fulfilling or meaningful or something I wanted to do, you know? Oh, the rage in which that I would have when I had commercial auditions, because that's, that's not why I became an actor to sell Mm. stuff, you know? The only commercials that I've actually ever done have usually been for like unions or (laughs) political parties or something like that, because the the meaning piece is really important to me. So that, that transformation, that like change in my core belief came from a place of like 
starting to examine my thinking about it. Oh, and this is hilarious. I'm going to do a PSA for cognitive behavioral coaching now, which is that this there's this understanding that mm-hmm. in life, when stuff happens, we've got thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that exist yes. around those mm-hmm. things. Yes, that's what we want to look at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, mm-hmm. and if we start to shift our thoughts, then we can start to shift our feelings and our behaviors, or at least that's mm-hmm. what CBT is all about, is that we work with the thoughts in order to change the like cycle that goes on in there. Yeah. And there's pros and cons, you know. I've got pros and cons, yeah, for sure. Last time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think that I kind of self-CBT'd this during this process where I was going, examining these thoughts and going, actually, do I believe that? Actually, is that what I value? Mm-hmm. Because I'm standing here, you know, coming to the end of 10 years in this career and going, wow, I don't, I don't think I want to be doing this, this way for the rest of my life. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Oh, I have so much resonance in that. Yeah. Cause yeah. <laughs> you, you and I connected before and I felt like, uh, going into a film, like, I'm so glad that you brought up that like core beliefs that kind of underpin yeah. the creative industry. And because sometimes I like even nowadays I say like oh I think there's a belief or s- almost stigma that like if you're not focusing on one thing in as an artist, uh, you're not one enough, and yeah. and and I keep tracking back. I say like, I don't think anybody like explicitly said that to me with like finger pointing. Yeah, but yeah. then they somehow just there like, and yeah. and not the. Like, you know, forget about, like, doing something completely different. Like, even when people hear, like, I've heard people who feel really iffy about going to teach about the craft, like, artistic mm-hmm. craft. Like, there's another mm-hmm. kind of core belief that uh, operate without what you yeah. do and what you teach. And Absolutely. so that's definitely, I think, for those of us, I think we share that, like, I, I find myself, like, thriving more when I'm, like, being able to switch lane and do different things. Uh, talking about kind of the system or the beliefs working against us, like there's that belief definitely is limiting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think one of the things I've come to realize about like wellness, because that's really what started my coaching journey was I was like, oh my God, this, the way that I've been living is not supporting me, um, supporting my wellness. Mm-hmm. One of the things I've realized is that if you only have one thing, that supports your wellness, then you're in a precarious position because if you lose mm-hmm. that one thing, then the whole building's going to collapse, right? Mm-hmm. So it's about diversifying. It's about having multiple things. So when I think about that in relation to my career, my one thing that gave me meaning and purpose was doing specific acting gigs that felt like they were aligned with my, you know, mission or values or what have you. Usually it was like only if I was doing acting gigs where I got to be a non-binary character, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't happen very often. And so that pillar, that one pillar that's supporting my sense of meaning and purpose is really precarious and is sometimes not there. Mm -hmm. So I needed to start diversifying my meaning and purpose so that it would be supported even if one or two of the pillars weren't available to me for whatever reason. I love that. That's probably one of the best take I ever heard on portfolio career. Because <laughs> they're... <laughs> yeah, like the, people coined the term yeah. in terms of talking about like, you know, that term, I'm pretty sure it's come from investing. Like you diversify your yeah. portfolio, your probably, watch, yeah. like more. But like there's this, a piece about that that's related to our personal meaning and wellness. Don't put all eggs in one bus. But basket in yes. anything. <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so take us back to that day that you're like, I think I need to, like, I think I want to like pick up coaching again. And what was the, what was that moment of decision? And right after the decision make, what did you do? My decision making processes are often elongated and that's part of my neurodivergence is Mm -hmm. that a need for a longer processing time. So I probably had about a year where I was knew that I wanted uh, another career, but I wasn't sure what that was going to be yet. I knew that I didn't want to be bouncing back and forth between retail. I never wanted to work a retail job again. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, But I still wanted to be able to pay my rent. So I was thinking about that and I kind of was like formulating in my mind this like 
idea that I didn't have a word for yet. I was like, oh, it's going to be like a holistic, you know, uh, something like kind of like a personal trainer, but not a personal trainer because I don't want to like actually focus on the fitness industry. That doesn't give me a lot of joy. Uh, so I was having a hard time pinning it down. And I was doing research because I live for research. I just love absorbing mm -hmm. knowledge. And I stumbled across a program that was like, life skills coaching hmm. um, and I went oh oh that might be that might be it I didn't even think that there was this was a thing I guess it's a thing so I read up on this program like intensely and I reached out and one of the admissions advisors called me and within like five days I went from thinking about this program to being early accepted with a scholarship wow <laughs> that was quick yeah it was mm. quick. It was, it, it's that, that we, when I think about the like, mm. stages of change, the contemplation stage for me is often quite long, but then mm. the action stage is often quite short mm -hmm. because I live so much in that contemplation and that planning space that by the time it's time to take action, things are all lined up. So mm -hmm. there was really a sense of like, ah, this is, this is just, like, this is it. Just, just, it was so easy, right? This is it. And the program that I um, went to is from a college in Vancouver called, Rhodes Wellness College mm. and I did the coaching program and then I continued into the counseling program because at the time I was like maybe I'm going to be a counselor and it was actually through the counseling program that I went oh I love coaching and I I don't think I actually want to counsel I think I only want to coach so the like decision to become a coach specifically took place over really like two and a half years mm. of sort of trying out other opportunities and experimenting and like learning how to be a counselor and then actually counselling some people and going, oh, this is good. There people seem to, to like this, but it doesn't give me the same like life or joy or yeah, aliveness, mm -hmm. I guess. I'm not sure. So For our audience sake, and also for my own sake, I know I asked you this before on a previous call, like what is the difference between counselling and coaching? question <laughs> and it's something that I've been really trying to parse for myself because mm -hmm. I've got skills in both it's important for me ethically to have a really clear line mm -hmm. because as a coach I've got a certain scope of practice and if I go outside of that then there's potential to to cause harm so there's a lot of similarities between coaching and counseling in a lot of different ways coaching to me is present and future focused uh, um, we don't mm -hmm. like go back and sit in trauma or try to process mm -hmm. the like roots of things necessarily that that lives more in the coaching realm. We'll, we'll pay attention to it. Yeah. We acknowledge we'll that exists that here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We acknowledge that exists. We, you know, wrap it in empathy. I'm a trauma informed coach. I think that's really important because trauma pops up all over the place. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're not trying to resolve it necessarily. We're working with the present and we're looking to the future. But some kinds of counseling do the same, you know? Some kinds of counselings don't sit in the back and in the trauma. They yeah, I was gonna say. Mm -hmm. future focused, right? So so that is that's part of the crossover mm -hmm. if we're talking Venn diagrams here. For me, the really big difference that I experience is is actually in the way that a client shows up. When somebody comes to me because they want counseling, there's a tendency for the belief to be, I have some expertise or some skill that they need in order to, you know, resolve. They need help. They need support. And there's a vulnerability there and there's a power difference. Mm -hmm. Even if I don't believe as a counselor that I have the power or I'm the expert or, you know, these kinds of things, which I think is a red flag mm -hmm. if your counselor believes that, there's still a power difference because of the nature of the relationship, which mm. is vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think is different than the coaching relationship where a client comes and is like, I'm seeking coaching, but there's less of a sense of like, I'm sitting in the expert space. The client's actually the expert mm -hmm. on their own life. And they have ultimate authority to say, I don't want to talk about that or I'm not going to go there. The work is client centered, or at least mine is in such a way that, that says I might be holding the map and the compass, but I'm yeah. not actually directing us, mm -hmm. you know, the clients in the driver's seat. And I find that that, that that perception of power difference changes the relationship quite a bit. Mm. 
and in an important way, I think, I think especially for me working with neurodivergent humans who often come from a lifetime of having people say, that can't be what you feel. That can't right. be what you think. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. Especially humans who are late diagnosed and didn't know for most of their life that they yeah. were neurodivergent. Mm -hmm. That power difference that exists in counseling can turn into a relationship that repeats some of that. That repeats the, oh, I've got to figure out what the counselor wants from me so that I do counseling right. Oh, I never thought about that. Powerful. Hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, I think part of the coaching relationship is set up in such a way that that, that is less of a risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was a long-winded answer. <laughs> I think it's very, like, uh, nuanced uh, and clear answer. Uh, it makes me think that, uh, you know, my natural question is, like, let's talk about your mission. How did you get there? But, like, it does make me think. The image that I had was when, you know, we all had, like, educational high school counselor i remember going to a counselor's room and yeah there was an expectation that like the counselor would tell me certain things whereas yeah. like the moment that i think about coaching i don't expect that as much even though i still expect the coach to have some sort of resource or like you said yeah. Yeah. maybe some kind of process to suggest yeah yeah great so you talk about like you, you know, at the beginning of this interview, you talk about that your mission is supporting world divergent, like folks, to create a world that work for them, not against them. How did you get to that mission, uh, and and how do you think that coaching would support that mission? <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, that that mission was sort of also formed over the last year and a half or so mm -hmm. because initially when i first started studying i was like oh i'm gonna work with trans folks um uh, because that mm -hmm. you know, that's a community that i'm a part of and i would experienced a lot of helping professionals who were cis and straight and needed me to educate them on my identity which is uh it's something i enjoy doing i enjoy educating people on these things but i prefer to get paid to do that, you know, yes. um, yeah. as opposed to paying someone else mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so I initially thought I was going to work with trans folks and then I was like, Oh, now I'm going to, I'm only going to work with artists. Uh, um, but, but I was realizing as I was meeting with clients and, and doing some of this work that actually it mattered less to me what a person's gender identity was or what their career was because the, the like, coach relationships that really popped off that really worked mm. were always between me and another neurodivergent human mm. no matter what their career mm -hmm. no matter what their you know sexual identity or mm -hmm. gender identity was if we had this neurodivergence piece then there was a fit there that existed mm. um, differently mm. so it was through that process of going oh actually i think the focus for me is that neurodivergence piece mm. um uh because that's where the like connection, those are the, that's where the connection happens. You can feel those the fit there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The fit. So when I realized that then, then came lots of like contemplation and time to think, I think so much, I have so many thoughts and I like to write them down places. Uh, uh, so I spent a lot of time contemplating and thinking about what I felt I had to offer. Mm -hmm. And I think that coaching piece specifically was something that I had to offer is a, like a pattern recognition ability, a systems thinking sort of mm. space, a problem solving space. These are the things that I bring as a coach, right? Mm. So we we're talking about how I'm not the expert. I'm not the expert, but I have skills and I have skills that I want to share. Curiosity, really good questions, um, uh, the capacity to like take multiple things and, and see them in an ecosystem as opposed to being separate mm -hmm. from each other. These are the kinds of things that I bring. And so I was like, okay, what, how is, how's that going to help? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is that going to do? Um, uh, and I was seeing in my own life and in my fellow students life, because there's a handful of classmates that I have who are neurodivergent themselves and who are constantly coming to me for support, mm -hmm. this piece of being overwhelmed by the systems that are asking us to act in ways that are contrary to our nature. Mm. 
And I, sitting from the outside, would go, oh, well, why can't we do this differently? Mm-hmm. If the system isn't working, why are we trying to change the people instead of the system? So this is the thing that I come back to in a lot of my like social media or my website or my text. Yeah. If the system isn't working, how can we change the system? Mm. Yeah. Powerful. There, I'll put that on a bumper sticker. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it feels like there's some like good, good uh, website copy that just came out from the yes. answer. It's like, yes. Yeah. yeah, I have mm-hmm. been living in website copy for the oh, last. Oh, I of hear weeks you. I'm working on building it right now. So yeah, the especially <laughs> like you know, I went through that whole phase of like I'm going through that phase now, like that like constant you're thinking or updating something that want to communicate yeah uh look I, I find that especially like uh, uh communicate a new identity piece i don't know whether you are experiencing that because like you know you have an act mm. person you have an actor identity and i think i i talk about that in my own work as well like when i just transitioned to you know being a consultant and coach like i'm like and i i see that with my client they're especially careful in that spot because there's a little bit of like, feels like a high stake. Yeah. So that's just some observation like that I make with myself and some other folks. Like, do you, as you transition into this new phase, how are you, I guess, uh, what are some ways that you find that are rewarding and some ways that are ch- challenging? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ways that the transition is rewarding and challenging. Related to the identity piece. Mm, the professional identity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is a good question. This is a very good question. I think especially as artists, we attach a lot of our identity to our professional yeah. labels. You know, they carry a lot of meaning and a lot of weight. There's, there's sort of gravity to them, you know. And some of the joy of my current experience of this current, like, transition shifting space is discovering new parts of myself and new bits of my identity that haven't got to have a name before. Mm. Like they've always existed, mm. but they didn't get to be identified or looked at or or cherished, you know? Um, there's joy in that. And there's also grief and and a little bit of loss in the like, the image that I had in my mind of the way that my career was supposed to go. There was a story that I had had written and internalized about what my journey was going to look like, which was going to be, you know, pounding the pavement and working hard. And then one day I'm discovered in an audition room. And all of a sudden now I'm a lead in a science fiction television series, because that continues to be a dream that I hold in my heart. Science fiction is my jam. But recognizing that that particular story is probably not going to be the way that my life goes. Mm -hmm. There's a loss there. There's a grief there in letting go of that, you know, which isn't to say that I'm not going to star on a science fiction TV show someday, maybe, but the way that I get there will look different. It will not look the way that I imagined it. Um, You know, things rarely do. So, so always in transitions, there's, the joy of sort of connecting with self in a new way and the loss that happens at the same time. I also have to acknowledge that, you know, as a, as a neurodivergent human transitions are really difficult for me. (laughs) Yes. They're really hard. They're hard. They take a lot of like internal resources. They tax me in a, in a particular way. So the challenge combined with the joy in this has been endeavoring to continue to care for my needs as this shift happens because new asks and and new things and and trying to build new routines out of nothing is hard yeah it's difficult um and it's particularly difficult for humans with spicy brains so Mm -hmm. yeah it's not always been easy or like clear by any stretch Mm -hmm. and that's okay yeah Lots to, lots there that I heard the you know one one thing that I think you shared is very valuable is that we sometimes think that like the like actually every moment or every transition is always with mixed emotion 
and I love what you share about like detaching ourselves to one story or one internal story we have about our career or ident career identity has grief, yeah. even though now you feel that excitement and joy in unfolding one part of yourself that's always been there. So I think yeah. acknowledging that like the transitional space is actually so muddy. <laughs> And can feel so long, also the uh, yeah, yeah, especially yeah. from the inside. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Even after, I always feel that even after you, like whatever the transition might be for folks, right, step into a new job, uh, yeah. going into a new profession, adding a new link to their business, even well after a couple months into that, you're still feeling the transitional mix of e emotion whatever that is yeah mm. yeah. yeah yeah absolutely mm. i mean transition doesn't stop when we start doing the new thing no mm -hmm. the transition continues into that space until we find ourselves in a in a space of like ease or you know unconscious competence mm. and that can take a long time yeah mm -hmm. so. i one thing that i'm very curious is you do acting you do coaching do you see any commonality in those two craft? Oh, yes. Mm. Yes. Absolutely, yes. My fellow students are probably sick of me raising my hand and going, this reminds me of enacting, blah, 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 blah. It's almost a meme now. I like to see that There's meme. so much. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, there's so much crossover for me because my... My approach to acting has always um, been rooted in uh, theories like Stanford Meisner's, which is holding that acting is living truthfully in imaginary circumstances. Mm -hmm. So I don't I I think of of my acting work as like approaching it with my whole self and finding ways that I connect to characters to find the truth of it in there, um, and coaching to me is also about living truthfully, but those circumstances aren't imaginary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're very real, they're very present. Well, sometimes they're imaginary. Sometimes we imagine ourselves into, into problems, sometimes not. So there's crossover there. I also find that in coaching, there's something really useful about the like objectives and tactics piece. Mm -hmm. So this is another piece of like basic actor training which is that every character in every scene has an objective. There's something that they want and they're using their words and their actions as tactics to try and achieve the objective. Mm -hmm. And I bring that directly out of acting into my coaching. Mm -hmm. When we're setting goals, when we're talking about problems, situations, or, or changes that people want to make, I am always asking, what's the objective here? And are our actions the tactics we're using actually moving us towards that objective. Mm -hmm. um, so direct transfer there, you know? I never thought of that. That's really neat. Yeah. yeah. I definitely asked that with a bias perspective, bias perspective that there is some commonality because I find commonality in the, the narrative, like the storytelling, like as a, yeah. a as a writer, yeah. like I definitely find that like the stories that we tell us, so how do we transform that? You know? Like there's lots of that mm -hmm. in the use of metaphor in coaching. Anyway, we can talk hours about that. So, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's another yeah, podcast. Another podcast <laughs> in itself. Uh, uh, so I want to ask you then, like, so let's say I'm an, uh, let's say a neurodivergent client comes to you and they want to work with you. Uh, what would be like something that for folks like, okay, this is a long the two fold question. For folks who are receiving coaching yeah. or working with a coach. Mm. And also I want to like, you know, raise awareness for coaches in general working with neurodivergence like commu communities. Like what would be something that to be aware of in, in terms of working with people who are neurodivergent? Mm. Yes. Yeah. Well, as coaches mm -hmm. I'll start there and then I'll... Yeah, uh, let's start there. Co coaches, clients, yeah. As coaches, there are pieces of uh, our training. We're, we're always cautioned about making assu assumptions, right? Mm -hmm. About what the client's going through or um, what's going on. 
and I think sometimes we don't realize the kinds of assumptions, especially the social assumptions, assumptions that live around us and in interactions and that kind of stuff. So what am I thinking about? I'm thinking about this piece that's come up a couple of times in my training, not just as a coach, but also as a counselor, where my instructors will say something along the lines of, oh, well, if somebody's not making eye contact, it probably means X, Y, Z. It means shame. It means this. It means oh. that. It means disconnection or mm. dissociation, that kind of stuff. And I immediately go, does it? Mm. Does it actually mean that? Mm. When, when did we become sure of that? Because I'm thinking of when I work with autistic clients, lack of eye contact means a very different thing. It's actually a very ordinary, mm -hmm. you know, situation and it may have absolutely nothing to do with a person's emotional state or, you know, their sense of avoidance or something like that, right? So a thing to know as a coach working with neurodivergent people is that your assumptions about what social behaviors mean may not apply. They might, but they might not. Yeah. So there's a need to check always, mm -hmm. right? If I've got a client who's actively avoiding eye contact, I'm going to pay attention to that, but I'm not going to assume that it means things and then tell the client what it means. I'm going to check if that's important. There's that part and you know? move with like, as a coach, it's much more, it's even more important than in that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That we check and that we, and then we approach all assumptions as an opportunity for curiosity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's also a piece in here as well for neurodivergence about getting clear about what the goals or the expectations are, mm -hmm. because like some neurodivergent humans will need and desire the ability to like go off on bunny trails and live in the bunny trails for a while. Uh, and others will say, ah, I've got a very clear goal. And so those bunny trails are not moving us towards the goal. So this question of what client centered means is a is partly in like getting really clear on what the expectations or what the client's desires mm -hmm. are. You know, I'm thinking about a client um, uh, that I have who who wants to get clearer on, on like actually going in a direction. And so my work as a coach is to go, ah, the client has been clear about what their desire mm -hmm. is. So I'm going to honor that desire, even if in the moment we're starting to like move off in this direction. Yeah. But to honor that desire, I'm not going to go, hey, get back mm -hmm. on task because that's an opportunity to like trigger some school trauma. Instead, I'm going to go, hey, we're moving off in a different direction. Is this something you still want to do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's an awareness there that is necessary. Mm -hmm. I think there's also an education that is needed for coaches if you are not neurodivergent as a coach. And even if you are neurodivergent as yeah. a coach, we talk about being trauma informed. I think you need to be neurodivergence informed. Totally. I was like, I, I don't know whether one can so like, ways. yeah, that's why I make that face. I was like, one cannot really, I mean, even the word neurodivergent, every time I say it, I was like, isn't everybody neurodivergent? Like in some way, like mm -hmm. aren't you always on the spectrum? Oh, yeah. Like the. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is a good question. I'd love to respond to it. When we speak about neurodivergence, we're speaking about a, a significant mm. difference and a significant enough difference that, that it's noticeable to humans Got around it. or noticeable mm. to the person inside, mm -hmm. right? So yes, human beings are widely diverse and there's a, and there's a, no two brains are precisely right. the same, but there are trends and there are <laughs> Um, uh, sort of like overarching categories that to some degree people can live within with mm -hmm. ease or mm. not. So when I'm speaking about neurodivergence, I'm speaking about human beings who cannot easily live within the neurotypical structures. I'm so glad I asked that question. No, this will give you, yeah, I'm like <sighs> learning a lot from this conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Because there's, there's a lot of talk right now, especially if there was a uh, about 10 years ago, ADHD was sort of in the zeitgeist and everyone was like, well, everybody's a little bit mm. ADHD. And now autism is more in the zeitgeist and people are going, oh, well, everyone's mm. a little bit autistic. Everybody is capable potentially of the behaviors or the experiences that happen within these categories, but not everybody experiences them consistently enough and to a great enough degree that it's causing distress mm -hmm. and harm to try and live in the neurotypical mm -hmm. space right so there is an distinction there, there. i think that's very important is. yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah not everybody is autistic everybody's capable of of you know 
not wanting to make mm-hmm. eye contact sometimes mm-hmm. or everybody's you know experiences some periods of time maybe when they're like not sure what their emotions mm-hmm. are or something like that insert autistic mm-hmm. trait here people can experience the traits the combination of them and the like and the degree that's a threshold exists yeah at all times. yeah mm-hmm. yeah a threshold yeah and that's an important nuance because there are there's this group of human beings who the like systems of the world actively cause harm to because of the combination of these traits and the threshold that they live, yeah. you know, myself included, yeah. right? So, uh, yeah. I'm so glad that you share with us this because, <laughs> like, yes, indeed, a lot of like uh, clients I work with in that are in that overlap, creative and also neurodivergent, and also I imagine them lots of like people that I haven't talked to listening to this podcast also find resonance in that and is a appreciation of that kind of distinction and some of the the cues and triggers that one might encounter because uh you know one of the things i always say to my client up front is that like there are like this distinction between feeling challenged and uncomfortable and there's lack of safety and i am always aware that like the people in the coaching dynamic there can be triggers that make few people to the extent of feeling unseen unsafe uh if we are not aware of those yeah Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Even that conversation about um, moving outside of your comfort zone. For a lot of humans, for a lot of neurotypical humans, um, that's an important thing to try and do mm. sometimes. It's to step outside of the comfort zone because that's where growth can be. And for a lot of humans who are neurodivergent, they have lived their entire lives outside that's of the comfort say. zone. Yeah. In mm-hmm. effort, right? in an effort to accommodate the neurotypical world mm-hmm. around them. So con- to continue to encourage those these humans to like step outside their comfort zone is to continue to perpetuate a lifetime of, mm-hmm. of discomfort, which cumulatively causes harm yeah. as well, right? So my in my work with my clients, generally speaking, some things that I say regularly are try easier instead of try harder uh find the thing that feels comfy and live Mm. there because that that experience of always being uncomfortable can turn into always feeling slightly unsafe and not being able to discern between Mm. the two so we need to find comfort so that we know how to compare it to discomfort we need to find safety so that we know how to compare it to unsafety to be able to like parks between the things i also really like to say anything worth doing is worth doing poorly Mm. i love that because doing it a little bit is better than not doing it at all Mm -hmm. right so try easier that should be on a bummer as well that should be a highlight it really should it really should website copy (laughs) (laughs) more website copy Mm. i have to acknowledge try easier i got from an acting Ah, instructor see full circle moment yeah full circle moment like yeah shout out to don mccarty sh- shout out to that uh like sounds like that like like that song between these things so like uh, establishing a benchmark for us like for well for everybody but for specifically for neurodivergent folks that the uh, d- distinguishing was like trying the stepping outside the comfort zone that served them and was like stepping outside the comfort zone that is actually just accommodating to the system that don't serve them yes. is very important. And yeah. only if you have very. a benchmark of like, what is the comforting that you can compare? I, I think that's so profound. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah. So what's next for you? And mm. in terms of your coaching, how can people find you and connect with you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what's next? Uh, I finish my uh, schooling in two and a half weeks, or at least I finish the course portion. Yay! And then I move into practicum. By the time um, this episode airs, you finish your school. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. what a dream! Mm-hmm. What a dream! Okay, so by the time y'all are listening to this, I'll be in my practicum. Um, uh, so doing the practicum at the same time, building my coaching business. So if you want to find my coaching business, check me out on Instagram at Alchemy Divergence Coaching. Lovely. Alchemy Divergence Coaching. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can also find my acting Instagram at Javelin Lawrence. 
and uh, you can connect with me uh, through either of those. I will be doing a little bit of acting in the fall. Ooh. If you're in Calgary and like to attend theater, keep an eye out for announcements on mm -hmm. that front. Yeah, I'm, I am so jazzed to be done school and to be moving into that space of actually doing my two careers mm -hmm. instead of just thinking about mm -hmm. it. We will leave all those links in the show note. And I had this like moment as you were talking about how excited you are that this episode itself feels a little bit like a time capsule. That it's yeah. right at this moment. Yeah, mm. I'm so excited to listen to this in two years or a year. And to a see year. It, it will be incredible. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and share your career journey and also so much. I think there is so much like, useful tips for uh, someone who is neurodivergent and might, might be considering coaching. And also, like, I've learned a lot as a coach on from this conversation. I'm so thankful. Amazing. Well, thank you, Betty, so much for having me. It has been a delight. Awesome. Yay! I hope you enjoyed this conversation I had with Javnet. I learned so much as a coach how to work with uh, humans that are neurodivergent. I'm so appreciative of Javelin sharing their journey, transitioning from one path to another uh, in their career. I'm excited for them to launch their coaching business. If you're a neurodivergent human wanting to connect with Javelin or considering to explore their coaching service, I encourage you to check out their links. We will include that in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you haven't, I invite you to follow the Everyday Talent Podcast on the platform of your choice. We are not on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, you name it, we are on it. And also, if you love the podcast, share with your friends and leave a comment. This way, more creators who are looking for intentional growth in their path can feel seen and get the resources that we share on this podcast. Also, a reminder that my one-on-one -on -one coaching program is now open. I have two signature programs, one geared more towards people who are mindfully reinventing their creative career and one gear more towards independent creators who are self-employed looking for intentional growth in the different lanes of the practice. Check out my website and book a free consultation call. May we all embrace our true self on our paths and build a career that is uniquely ours. See you on the next episode.